And it's like, you heard the pastor. Pack your bags. Get out. I saw at least 15 out of the 30 people with their upper plates out of their mouth, cleaning the communion out of their teeth. Some of you have built the wall over the exit and you can't get out, but it's God's fault. No, you built the wall. But if you sit still long enough, then he will send his angels in charge over you and you will hear the, hear the drill taking the nails out of the wall that you built over the door. God is good. You may have a seat. You may have a seat. Well, I titled today's message, I Did It My Way. Some of you Frank Sinatra fans out there, you may recognize the title, I Did It My Way. Now, there's pros and cons to doing things your way. The pros are, you know, you do it against the world and you do good. But then you do it against God and it's not really a pro, it's a con. Because we can't wait for God so we decide to do it our way, and then we suffer the consequences. But somebody say amen. We serve a good God that says no matter what you do, I got you. I'll line you back up again. I'll put you back on track again. It doesn't make a difference how far left you go or how far right you go. As long as you come to the Lord, he's going to put you back on the tracks again. So, you know, there's people like me that would jump the gun early because I'm a gun jumper. I'm like, I'm like one of these kind of guys. You know when the horses are in, the, in the, the, those stalls? I'm the one that bangs against the stall. I'm more like a bull than a horse, you know? I'm banging against the side, waiting for it to open. I end up hurting myself before I even get out to run. So God, when, I, when it came to ministering the gospel and preaching, I was doing stand-up comedy for kids, so I never even consumed the thought of ever having a church. This thought never entered my mind. So see, I didn't try to make this happen, but I, I tried to make plenty of other things happen that my wife is like, Joe, if you do this one more time, I'm, you know because I have made things happen that should have never happened, you see? And now I have to suffer the consequences, but God gets me out of them all the time. So God never, he never told me about this church thing that we're gonna do. And he never told me what it was gonna be like. And he never told me, you know, things that get me excited so that I can pursue them and make them happen. And then one day I woke up and he said, it's time. I'm like, are you kidding me? It really? Like, I, I don't wanna do this, God. But the second he said, it's time, the peace of God came upon me. And I was so excited. And then when I knew my wife was excited, we knew we had something going on that God was going to bless us. So, but, but, you know, God starts you off. And sometimes he just tests you for no other reason than to just test you. Right. And sometimes he uses things to build your future and to build your hope. But you don't know it's happening, but you don't always like it. Like, for instance, for instance my, my grandparents, they were not the healthiest. They were old when I was born. And so they, we, I, got, I had to watch them suffer and I had, to, I had to watch them in a nursing home. And at one point, it's like, I didn't like nursing homes because you get that mental thinking of your grandparents in that nursing home, right? So it was a Sunday morning and somebody called me up, my wife and I and said, hey, Joe, what are you doing this week? I says, I'm not out of town. And they said, well, good. I wasn't, church wasn't even a thought in my mind. And he said, why don't you come and, and speak at a nursing home? I'm like, hmm. <laughs> Well, because I have to, I have to go, uh, there's a, a, a party that's, and then I have to speak at the, and, and, and the airplane is leaving, and I, I'll be there. <laughs> so I did. I, I, go to the, I go to this nursing home with my wife, and it wasn't just a nursing home where elderly people just came and, and partook. The, this was the nursing home where they had to have, like, care 24 7 and they were they were in wheelchairs and they were in stretchers and they were in beds and they had they had you know dementia and alzheimer's and all kinds of it it was just really a very sad situation and i walked in there and i'm like what am i gonna say so I would just, I, I, I'm like, as I'm standing, I, there was no platform. They couldn't even see me. So I stood on a chair and I stood on a chair and I'm speaking to them and I would talk, and this is like 06, and I'm talking to the people and, I, and sometimes they're shouting out to me. They're shout, my husband's coming to, to see me today. Okay. And then the nurses would come by and say, he passed away 10 years ago. They don't know. And so I'm like, and is there, and they're just keep going and they're going and they're going. And I'm like, 
Why am I here? What am I doing this for? And, 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 so, and then there was this guy, he would sit right here to my right. He was 102 years old and had all of his mind, but he couldn't see very well. And the whole time I'm preaching, be careful up there. Be careful on that chair, young man. Be careful. Are you okay? I'm good, guy. His name was Guy. I'm good, guy. And so, that, and so this went on. And then when I got down, I'm like, whew, thank God that's over. And God said, no, I'm going to need you here every week. But Lord, what if I have to go out of town? You won't. So for six months, every Sunday, I went to this nursing home. For no reason. Why am I doing it? I never asked him why. And I didn't try to change it and do it my way. I just says, whatever you want, God. But it was, the, it was one of the last few times I was there before it was time to go. And I said to my wife, I said, I think we need to have communion with these people. Not all of them could eat because some of them have, have uh, stomach tubes. It, it was just a very sad situation. So I said, okay. She goes, okay. So we get the communion. We bring our own little wafers and we, we, we hand them out. We had some people that are helping us out and everything. And, and this is a true story. I cannot make this up. I can't make it up, okay? So communion is a very holy thing for me. So we hand it all out and everybody's, everybody's taking communion and we, we take it together. And as I'm done, I, I'm praying over them. And I'm standing on the chair and I got my eyes closed and I'm praying over these people. And it, I'm just so in into it, right? And when I opened my eyes, what I saw, I will never forget. I saw at least 15 out of the 30 people with their upper plates out of their mouth, cleaning the communion out of their teeth. <laughs> oh, you think I'm joking? And I looked to my wife and I'm like, what are they doing? And she's like, they're cleaning their teeth. <laughs> now? now? I mean, literally, it's like, it's like mm, and it's like, and I'm up there going, <laughs> you think it's funny, aha. <laughs> but that prepared me for all, the, all of you old people. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I don't know what it, sometimes God just wants you to do things just to see if you'll do them. Amen? But when you try to do it your way and you look for excuses why you don't have to do it, then God's like, well, you're just going to go around that mountain because I got something you're going to learn here. I may have figured it out by now. Maybe I didn't. I don't know. But I said, you know what, Lord? I'll do whatever you want whenever you need me to do it because I'm done doing things my way. I want to start doing them your way. Somebody say amen. amen. So there's a scripture, amazing scripture, Psalms 121, verse 1. It says, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. My, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Wow. The word slumber means in the Hebrew, never takes his eyes off of you and never sleeps. Hallelujah. That's what that word means right there. So your help comes from God. He's got his hand on you. He's got you so that your foot won't even slip. As long as you, are, you keep your eyes on him, he's got his eyes on you. Well, we say, well, Joe, I've slipped sometimes. I've messed up sometimes. But if you don't want him and you push God aside and decide to do it your way, he's a gentleman. He'll just let you go. Right. See, but he, he'll, if it's part of his plan and you're about to get hurt, he will rescue you even, even if you're not crying out his name in hopes that you will find his name while he's rescuing you. This is the kind of God that we serve. So if we understand, I really want you to think about this today. Those of you watching on the broadcast, I want you to just get a hold of somebody who's watching this and you're like, you know, my life is in the We're not, No one's interested in how you feel your life is. No one is interested on how you feel your life is because God has a plan that you haven't even seen yet. And if you will just let him do it his way rather than do it your way, he's got a blessing that you can't, you're going to sit back and go, whoa. I can't imagine that this even happened because that's the kind of God we serve. So, but if we understand that our help comes from the Lord, then why do we keep pushing God and attempting to do it ourselves? Why do we try to fix things? So, you know, that's why I titled today's message, I Did It My Way, because I want you, it's like a play on words that I don't want you to do it your way. I want you to do it God's way and not your way. Many of us are totally exhausted because we have tried to accomplish what God has never intended for us to do. Some of you are in relationships. You're not supposed to be in them. 
Some of you are working jobs. God never told you to do them. Whoa. (laughs) Good, I get to quit tomorrow. (laughs) Hold on. Hold on. (laughs) You better ask them first, okay? So here, here, listen to this. Matthew 11, verse 30 says this. Uh, You all know the scripture, but I'm going to explain it to you different today. My yoke is easy and my burden is light, God says. Jesus, this is Jesus talking. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. What does that mean? Well, see, the yoke is what I have asked you to do. It's what I put on you, the Lord says. The yoke is what he puts on you, but the burden is a load that is not going to be too much for you. So when you were born into this world, God put a God put a plan on your life, but the plan is not going to overtake you unless you get in and try and do it your way. The plan is meant to work effortlessly if you stay out of it and just follow him. Amen. Oh, somebody getting a hold of this? Because you should be, light bulbs should be going off going, so that's it. See, don't divert the plan. Just give it back to God and quit trying to make it happen yourself. He's got the plan for you. Now, see, watch this while. It's human nature. It's, it's human nature for all of us to, to, and this is a metaphor, to get into a maze and try and find our way out. But sometimes God puts you in a maze that doesn't have a way out so that he can get you out. Sometimes he brings you to a Red Sea so that you can't cross it until he splits it. You see what I'm saying? But so why does God do that? Because he wants you, as it says in Psalms 46, 10, he wants you to be still And when you're still, you will know that he's God. Now, now hold on a second. I want to explain this to you. The word word know is the word I want you to focus on here for a second. And the word know in in the Hebrew, it literally means this. It means to recognize, to acknowledge, and to confess. Wait a minute. I don't understand what that is. If you are still... If you are understanding that you could do it his way, if you, are, if you are, can tell yourself and take authority over yourself to be still and quit trying to make things happen your way, then you will begin to recognize that it's God. Hallelujah. If you are still, you will be able to acknowledge that the hand that is moving is God. And if you are still long enough, then you will be able to confess to everyone what God has done. Amen. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's all he says to do. Listen, I got you in a maze. Some of you are in a maze right now. You're banging this way. You're banging this way. You're you're walking. You're exhausted. Okay, sit down. Just sit. Just plop right there and say, Lord, unless you, I can't. When are you going to get there? Well, because we live in a world that we we make our own destiny. Okay, good luck. Let me know how that goes for you. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do yourself because God says, I give you the ability to. I give you the ability to produce wealth. So if God gives you the ability to make money, then he gives you the ability to go get a job and he gives you the ability to do the job. But there are just some things that are out of your hands. Sickness, disease, just challenges in life, things that, messes that you got yourself into. Some of the mazes, you've built the wall over the door. I'll say it again. Some of you have built the wall over the exit and you can't get out, but it's God's fault. No, you built the wall. But if you sit still long enough, then he will send his angels in charge over you and you will hear the, hear the drill taking the nails out of the wall that you built over the door. Yes, Amen. Amen. God's good, isn't he? Woo! God is so good here. God is so good. I love it so much. Okay, watch this. This is a true story about it, well, Ishmael and Isaac. And I was just going to brief over it, but then there's some people that are like, I don't know who Ishmael and Isaac are. Well, you know who Ishmael and Isaac are when I'm done telling you this, but I'm going to start with Genesis chapter 15, verse 2. Abraham didn't have any kids. He's an old man. He's 75 years old. He's a 75-year-old man. He has no kids. He has nobody to leave his wealth, and he was wealthy. He had nothing to leave his heir to. So it says in verse 2 in Genesis 15, but Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham said, you have given me no children, so a servant of my household will be my heir. God put a request into the, I mean, excuse me, Abraham put a request into God. This is what you have to do. You can't forsake prayer. You don't want to forsake the assembly. You don't want to forsake worship and honor because you want to get on your knees and you got a request. Put it in and then wait. Don't put it in and then do it your way. 
Okay? Now watch what happens here. Watch what happens here. So then in verse 4, it says, then the promise came. So that was the request. Now the promise comes. In verse 4, God says, then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. Are you kidding me? I'm 75. My wife is a little bit younger than me. We, we don't even have, we, we should be taking care of grand, great-grandchildren, not having our first kid. See, this is how your life looks to many of you. Some of you out there right now, this is going to bless you so much. Somebody's watching online because you don't know where else to go. You are so confused with the way the world tells you you have to live that you can't see a way out and you're building door, walls over your doors and your maze. You can't see God because you're not listening because you're too busy trying to do it your way. I know I've been there. I've been there. But see, God has a plan. And in, I love it right here. Now, watch this. In, in Genesis chapter 16, verse, uh, verse 1, now Sarai, who is Sarah, so I'm just going to use their name Sarah and Abraham instead of Sarai and Abram because their name was changed later just for the sake of, of going, moving quickly here. Now, Sarah, and Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian, Egyptian slave named Hagar. Mm. So she said to Abraham, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Somebody say, I did it my way. Now watch what happens when you do it your way. Because you see, why did it happen that way? Because it had already, it had already literally, literally been 10 years since God said, you're going to have a son. Well, I was 75, now I'm 85, and it doesn't look like anything's happening. Some of people come to church. Well, I've been here three weeks already, ain't nothing happened. I'm done with that. Okay, well, then take it up with Abraham, because he's now waiting 10 years. But in the midst of the 10 years, his beautiful wife, Sarah, who is older than dust, is now emotional and feeling for her husband. Like, I wish that would, God's been promising me and I'm, I'm still waiting. It's been three hours. Okay, I get it. I see how this is working. But see, people in your life love you so much that they want to encourage you to do it your way. You can't forfeit God. You can't rush God. Amen. Amen. So watch what she says. She says, you take this wife, this, this maidservant of mine, and maybe I can build this family that God is talking about because he is not moving fast enough. So maybe I can do it. Maybe I can get in there and I'll give you the maidservant, bada boom, bada bing, baby done. Whoa, this is what we do. God doesn't work fast enough. So we step in and go, good try, Lord. I mean, I appreciate what you said, but you're just taking too long. So I got it. So I got it. I got it. Watch this. Watch this. Now, Abraham's wife, I already said that. Forgive me. Let's go back. Let's go to Genesis chapter uh, 16, verse 3. Abraham agreed with what Sarai said, Sarah said. He agreed. Whoa, listen to this now. Don't miss this. So after Abraham had, had been living in Canaan for 10 years, Sarah, his wife, took the Egyptian slave, remember I told you 10 years, took the Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. And when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress, which is Sarah. Then Sarah said to Abraham, you are responsible for the wrong that I am suffering. I told you that you should have a baby with my maidservant. I made you do it, and now you're, you got her pregnant, and now she's not treating me nice. It's your fault, Abraham. <laughs> and all the men out here are going, so it started back then. <laughs> Keep listening. I'm going to bless you ladies. I'm going to bless you ladies. Watch this. You ready for this? Okay, listen to this. He's... Uh, where was I? Oh, I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. My gosh. And you women wonder why we can't figure you out. I mean, think about it. You tell your husband, don't, and he doesn't, and then you get mad because he doesn't. Honey, are you okay? I'm good. Did you want to go out to eat tonight? No. 
Okay. <laughs> now they're mad at you. You're supposed to know that they wanted you to go out to eat. How are you supposed to know that? <laughs> men, you, you know what, men? Stop it. You want to cheer and you want to clap right now, but you're being quiet because your wife's sitting next to you. I'm hearing little chuckles of men going, <laughs> and then looking at their wife, <laughs> he's crazy. I don't feel that way. <laughs> Smart. Men, I'm, you're going to hear the women cheer in a minute. All right? Get ready, ladies. Get your voices going. Watch this now. Sarah can't blame Abraham for something she suggested, can she? Hmm. She shouldn't be able to blame him for suggesting that he sleep with her maidservant, right? This is how I think. Who is the one who is guilty here? It was Abraham's fault because God spoke with him, not her. You can't hear from God and then put your wife in a position over God and then put her in an uncomfortable situation. If God said, wait, then you wait. Amen. Yes. Come on. Give me a praise break. Come on. You can't jump in. Oh, true story. True story. I got to tell you this story. My wife and I, we laugh about this all the time. Jenna, who's now 21, when she was like two years old, three years old, and she, Terry didn't like her chewing gum because she'd just drop it out of her mouth. She'd find it in her hair. She did it. It's all over the place. So Terry's in a parking lot one day, and she's putting Jenna in the car seat, and Jenna says, I have gum. No, baby. You throw, you spit your gum out. You lose your gum. I won't lose it. I won't lose it. I promise. I won't lose it. I promise. I won't lose it. Please, can I have gum? Please. I want gum. Please. So Terry's going from this parking lot in the mall around the corner to the other parking lot. So she's like, what could it hurt? So she gives Jenna a little tiny piece of gum, and she's chewing the gum. True story. I can't make it up. She gets to the other side. She opens the van door to pull out Jenna, and she goes, where's your gum? I don't know. <laughs> Jenna, I gave you gum, and, and, and you lost it. She goes, I told you not to give it to me. Three years old, lost the gum. Whose fault was it? Mama's fault. She knew she was going to lose the gum. So you can't blame the kid for losing the gum when you know that's what she does with it. Amen? God did not speak to Sarah about the baby situation. She spoke to Abraham. Quit pushing it off on your wife, men, and become the man of the house and listen to the Lord. Amen? I'm just letting you get it all out there, Patricia. <laughs> so, true story about Jen, I promise you on that one. So now, this is what we do. Sarah gave birth to Ishmael. This was not God's will. It was man's will. So now, we are stuck with man's will. What are you talking about, Joe? Well, Ishmael is your life, and it never, it's in your life now, and it'll never go away. When you make that decision, it's go it ain't going anywhere. Ishmael is the... Let me, let me... Hold on, hold on. Ishmael is born. He was never supposed to be born, but he was born. So in your mistakes, God will even bless you in your mistakes. Watch this. Genesis chapter 16, verse 11. The angel of the Lord also said to her, this is Hagar said, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael. For the Lord has heard your misery, because she's in pain now. Okay, watch this now. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live in hostility towards all of his brothers. What is that? I don't get who Ishmael is. How many people remember 9-11? How many people remember the Twin Towers coming down? How many people remember the terrorist acts that are happening around the world? Do you know who's doing it? Ishmael's kids. He is, if you don't, listen, if you don't believe in God, 
Listen to this. This is in Genesis. This is the first book way back. I mean, of course, Job was older, but the way it's set up in the Bible. This, this is Abraham. And he, God spoke and said, this Ishmael, now as I say this, I want you to think of what, a, what these terrorist acts have been like since you've been listening. Why does this have to happen to our country? Why did this have to? It's in the Bible. And the word of God will not be changed until the people see the darkness. They won't look for the light. Amen. So it says right here, I'm going to read it again because I want you to just get a hold of how God is so precise way back 5,000 years ago, and here it's happening right now in our present day. He will be a wild donkey of a man, would you not say? Okay. He will, his hand will be against everyone. Everyone is the infidel. Keep listening now. And everyone's hand will be against him. He will, he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. I will always be causing trouble against every war. The biggest wars in the world are, are between Israel and Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael and Isaac. You see, Isaac doesn't have to put up with Ishmael, but Ishmael never goes away. So the next time you want to do it your way, remember, it's going to be with you for a little while. But that's okay. There's always a way out because God is a good God. So let's keep listening here. Ishmael is born, and he's, he, he, uh, he grows up. He's a little bit older than Isaac. He's a lot older than Isaac, and he begins to mock Isaac. So now watch this. He begins to mock Isaac, and in, in Genesis chapter 21, 14, this is what, uh, I'm not going to read it, but you can, just, you can understand it. In 21, 14, Abraham sends Ishmael away. He says, you no longer can stay here. You and your mom, I'll set you up. You're going to be okay, but you're going away because now Isaac is born. I'm not going to get into how Isaac is born, but Isaac was born at, when Abraham was 99 years old and his wife was older than dust herself, but they had the baby that God promised, but they still have Ishmael. I said they still have Ishmael. So Ishmael is now becoming a problem to his brother Isaac, so Abraham sends him away. You can send him away, but he's never going to be gone. Are you listening? Now watch this. Watch this here. Hold on. Okay. The things you... you okay, hold on a second. Let me, let me just focus here because I want to make sure you hear this just right. You cannot grow in your full potential as an Isaac... Until you send your Ishmael away. Those of you that are out here going, I don't have any Isaacs. I don't have any kids at all. Come on. We're not talking about kids now. Until you send Ishmael away, Isaac, your perfect will in your life can never fully grow because the, the, the permissive will that you made happen is always taunting you and reminding you of your failures. So you send it away. And you get rid of it. You can't, listen, okay, now hold on a second because I can, I can see where this group is going here. Because some of you are, you know, you're having arguments with your wife or your husband and it's like, you heard the pastor, pack your bags. Get out. You're a stumbling block to me, go. Had about enough of you, sir. Just keep the checks coming, but go. We're not talking about that. We're talking about this right here. The things that you have done that have haunted you now have to be sent away. Your past has got to be put to sleep. Your mistakes have got to be put away. Your thinking process has got to be gone. Stop dwelling on them and just send them away, meaning focus on the Isaacs and take your eyes off of the Ishmaels. Amen? Because the Ishmael is only meant to taunt you. Stop looking at your mistakes in life and your setbacks. Stop looking at your mistakes in life as your setbacks. Stop looking at the mistakes in your life as your setbacks. They are Ishmaels. Send them away. God knows the plan he has for you not to harm you, a hope and a future. There's always a perfect will that is going to show up even though the permissive will you allowed to happen. God will still show the perfect will. Amen? But now you have to learn how to control that imperfect will, that one that you made happen, and focus on the one God has for you. Amen. 
and you watch what he's going to do for you. You're not going to fail. It's, it's harder for you to fail in this world than it is to, than to not fail. You, you're not going to fail. You are not going to fail. As long as you understand Isaac is what you keep your eyes on, Ishmael, you send away. Amen. Amen. Keep listening. Watch it. Don't focus on past relationships. Don't, do not focus on your past relationships. Focus on the one you have now, but learn from the Ishmael relationship that you had. Whether it's be your job, whether it's your, your, your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend or fiance, whatever it is, always remember your past, always remember your life with Ishmael so that you can enjoy your life with Isaac. Amen. Amen. Woo! Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody preach with me today. Come on, man. I'm going to have to have another praise break and I'm in here. All right. Ishmael must be sent away in order for God to develop Isaac to his full potential. But Ishmael will always be a strong voice. However, it is not to overcome Isaac, but rather to strengthen who Isaac is to be. Amen. Amen. What's that mean, Joe? I don't want to think that much. That means that Ishmael in your life is not meant to destroy you. It's meant to strengthen you. Come on now. Hallelujah. It allows you to hold on to God because the louder Ishmael is, the more you have to hold on to God. So God uses the Ishmael to strengthen your walk with him and put you in a place in a maze with walls that are covering the doors while Ishmael is calling you a subservient monster. And you have got to say, I will no longer listen to this. I got my eyes on you, Lord, because you will lift me up. You will hold me in your hand. You will make it happen. You're going to put your angels over me. You're going to take the screws off of the boards so that the door is exposed and show me where I have to go. You can no longer look at the Isaacs, the Ishmaels rather, because you got to stay focused on the Isaac. Ishmael is not the enemy, but remember, it's also not the destiny. Amen? However, send Ishmael away, and you are making room for your destiny. That's as simple as it can get. It can't get any simpler than that because in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 22, I love what it says here. It says, the smallest family, listen, the smallest family will become a thousand people, and the tiniest group will become a mighty nation at the right time time, I, the Lord, will make it happen. Now, you got to hold on to this, okay? I want you to hold on to this because somebody out here right now is just about to jump over the edge and bring an Ishmael into this world. Stop. Hold back. Hold back. God has clearly said to you, he has clearly said to you in the word in Isaiah chapter 60, which points to the cross. He says, the smallest family, the least that you think you are. Some of you feel I'm not even worthy to be, I'm not, I don't even want to go to church because I don't even feel like I'm worthy to sit in a pew. I'm such a sinner. Stop the madness. Stop that. That's the enemy. And that's religious people telling you how you're not worthy. That is ridiculous. Hell, these walls come down and let hell come in. That's how my prayers are my prayers. Take the walls down, Lord, and bring hell into this church because once they meet you, they will not go out the same way. Amen. So I want you to just hold on to every thought, every Ishmael that you might have brought into your life. I need you to send those Ishmaels away because God has an Isaac for you, whether it's already here or whether it's on its way. There is an Isaac coming for you. And the Isaac that is coming has got the full potential of God's blessing in your life. Ishmael will never leave. He is there to always remind you and strengthen you. And the stronger you get as an Isaac, then you will reach back into the Ishmael world and pull them towards God and not against their wild donkey of a life. Amen? God has a plan to save everybody, and he uses the righteous to even go after the unrighteous, even though you don't want to go near them. I'm going to read this one more time, and then I'm closing this ship down. The smallest family will become a thousand people, Isaiah chapter 60, verse 22. And the tiniest group, the littlest person that you are, the one that nobody recognized, will become a mighty nation. Somebody say mighty nation. Somebody say mighty nation. And he says this, at the right time, God says, I will make it happen. Let me tie it in. 
Sarah said, you go sleep with Hagar and maybe I can make it happen. God says that you wait to the appointed time. I will make you a great nation. I will make you powerful. At the right time, he says, I will make it happen. It's not your worries. Amen. Come on, man. Somebody give him the biggest, loudest praise break. Come on, people. Man, that's all I got. We don't want you to leave today without giving you an opportunity to follow Jesus. The Bible says the only way to the Father is through the Son. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We invite you to take a moment and ask God to forgive you and to help you follow him on this journey. If you've made this decision today, make sure that you get into a church that teaches the Word of God. And remember to read the instruction manual. That's the Bible. If you're in the area, come visit us at any time. Check out times and location at orlandofamilychurch.com or at 407-462-1358. Hope to see you there.